Pay close attention. The news you're about to see is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you the news that relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Yeshua Hawkins. Well, a lot of great stories tonight, mm -hmm. uh, Katan, to talk about. We're going to look at who the big military spender is, mm -hmm. and believe it or not, they want to spend even more money on their military advancements. Right. Also, we're going to talk about uh, some of the vaccines, AstraZeneca dealing with blood clots that uh, mm -hmm. those who are getting the vaccines are experiencing as a side effect. Right. So those details, and more, of course, on the COVID, uh, which countries are experiencing a uh, increase in cases. Mm -hmm. India now just found a more severe mutant strain mm. there, so they're having to deal with that. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk about, uh, again, the U.S. and China tensions and how that military spending plays into right. um, that situation. Okay. But first, we're going to talk about the high temperatures and the drought here in the United States. Well, the Western United States is under increasing risk for wildfires to break out as temperatures continue to remain in the triple digits. In just one morning, Utah reported five wildfires and the governor there has declared a drought emergency. Governor Spencer Cox is asking for everyone to reduce their water usage and start praying for rain. In a statement saying, quote, we need some divine intervention. Interesting. Utah already the second driest state in the country, but consumes more water per capita than any other state. Uh, farmers are definitely struggling to keep things going. As uh, Ron Gibson, a uh, sixth generation farmer, told CBS this morning, he said, quote, I don't know how long we can survive because I don't know how bad it's going to get, end quote. Well, Gibson operates his family's farm just north of Salt Lake City. This year, his water allocation was cut by 70%. So he's covering his plants with plastic to conserve water in an effort to keep them alive. Well, the feed for Ron's dairy cows has also doubled in the last year, and life is very uncertain right now. And as Mr. Gibson says, quote, when agriculture is gone, then our ability to produce food is gone. And that's what scares me the most about this whole situation. I can mm. imagine that. I mean, uh, you know, you have to have the agriculture. You have to be able to produce food. So now taking the, cutting the water back, that's a scary situation. Oh, yes, for sure, for sure. But farmers aren't the only ones feeling the effects of the drought. It is statewide with 90% falling in the extreme drought category. Well, never before in modern history has the Great Salt Lake been expected to reach as low as it is projected to reach this year. The director of Utah Rivers Council, Zach Frankel, told CBS News reporter Jonathan Vigliotti, we would be standing underwater had it been a normal water year. Well, Mr. Frankel explains 90% of our precipitation comes in the winter in snow, as snow. Now, as our winter temperatures continue to rise, we're getting less and less snow in our mountains. Now, the marinas would, uh, that would normally be floating on 10 feet of water are bone dry right now. But Utah is not isolated in feeling the effects of this severe drought. The Colorado River is fed by Utah's Great Salt Lake and less water there means water worries downstream for almost 40 million people across seven states. Wow. Well, scientists have assessed the situation, calling it a mega drought, and says it is the result of climate change. Well, CBS News senior environmental correspondent Ben Tracy went to see for himself just how bad the situation is at an American icon, the Hoover Dam. Well, for 85 years, the dam has held back the waters from Nevada's Lake Mead, which also flows into the Colorado River, but water levels barely cover the massive, massive concrete structures back now. Well, Pat Mulroy, the former head of the Southern Nevada 
Water Authority tells CBS News Lake Mead is on track to hit the lowest water levels ever recorded. Now, Lake Mead is the nation's largest reservoir supplying the Las Vegas, Phoenix, and Southern California region. Now, without it, there would be only desert where agriculture has flourished for decades. Now, Pat Mulroy expressed her concern, saying, this landscape screams problems to me. I mean, just look at the bathtub rings. To me, that is an enormous wake-up call. And that's quite a change for decades, and now this. So you definitely see there's a problem. That's right, that's right. Well, currently Lake Mead is at only 30% of its capacity and hasn't been at its normal level since 2000. Back then, its waters came right up to the top of Hoover Dam. Uh, since that time, Lake Mead has lost 130 feet. Uh, if you can think of a 13-story building um, and how tall that is, that's how much water has disappeared, leaving a huge rings around the hills in the area that many, like Miss Mulroy, call bathtub rings. Well, Mulroy says, we're at a tipping point. It's an existential issue for Arizona, for California, and for Nevada. It's just that simple. Well, due to the mega drought, the federal government is looking at declaring a water shortage for the lower Colorado River later this summer. Now that'll mean mandatory water cutbacks to Nevada and Arizona beginning in the year 2022. Now homeowners will not feel the effects as badly as farmers in the region. And second generation farmer Dan Thielander from Pennell County in Arizona explains, quote, if we don't have irrigation water, we can't farm, end quote. Now, his crops of corn and alfalfa are irrigated by the waters of Lake Mead, and next year they will get 25% less. Mm. Well, if things stay on the downturn by 2023, Mr. Thielander and other farmers in the Arizona uh, area will lose all of their water supply from Lake Mead. Well, not ready to give up yet, they are digging wells to find water to save their farms. Well, the Hoover Dam is facing some problems as well. The dam generates hydropower for the region, but has cut its output by almost 25%. Now, they've installed new turbines for the generators, which are designed to help things run more efficiently, but only for about 100 more feet of lost water levels. Now, back at Lake Mead, Mulroy insists, quote, we don't change unless we absolutely have to, but when you look out at this lake, I think that moment of it's absolutely necessary has arrived. Yeah, and you figure, you know, they only have another 100 feet to operate those dams. And taking into consideration um, 130 feet is where they're currently at. You know, that puts us in a pretty scary predicament, at least for those 40 million people who depend on not only just the waters from, uh, you know, the mountains that supply Lake Mead, but also the produce that comes out of that that supplies the entire country. Right, it's going to affect a lot more than just those people in that area. Of course, they're going to be hit very hard, but you know, now with these, uh, with with the continuation of the drought, the mm -hmm. high temperatures, mm -hmm. putting them in a very critical situation. That's right. Well, amidst the pandemic, the FDA has found time to approve a new treatment for Alzheimer's. Uh, it's the first of its kind in almost 20 years. Biogen's new drug branded. Alduhem is an infusion given to monthly, uh, given monthly, excuse me, to patients who are in the early stages of the disease. The purpose is to help slow cognitive decline, and that will make it the first treatment to target the workings of the disease itself. Drug makers are also looking for new ways to help with other health issues. 40% of Americans suffer from obesity, in addition to other chronic health issues like diabetes high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. Well, my, while more and more drugs are coming to the market, Senator Suzanne Collins shared her concerns about the ongoing overdose epidemic in Maine and how she feels the country is moving in the wrong direction to change things. Now, citing a Maine newspaper's headlines, she read, Maine overdose deaths set a new record in 2020 and 2021 started out even worse. Now, Collins said the state experienced a 32% increase 
in overdose deaths in 2020. Now, what's even more alarming is that more people died of drug overdoses than died from COVID-related issues. Hmm. And speaking of COVID, uh, the U.S. is fast approaching 600,000 confirmed deaths from the pandemic. While the virus continues to mutate and spread, drug makers Johnson & Johnson has had a major setback. The FDA is ordering J&J &J, uh, to throw away 60 million doses of its COVID shot. The doses were produced at Emergent Biosolutions Factory and are thought to be contaminated. Well, this comes as the company was already experiencing a delay in production. It had promised to deliver 100 million doses by the end of May, but by mid-June had sent out less than 22 million. While Moderna and Pfizer are keeping the country supplied, the demand has actually dropped for the vaccine. Well, we're going to take a look uh, and turn over to our field correspondent, Larry McGee, who has more uh, for us in regards to uh, the vaccines and their effects, uh, some of the side effects that people are suffering as a result of it, um, as well as uh, some of the, like you mentioned earlier, surges that we see taking place in different parts of the world, including in Asia, and uh, some things that um, Duterte is actually bringing some warnings out um, for the people. Uh, Larry, what do you have for us? Amid all of the desperate hope being invested in vaccines, there is constant reminders which shatter the illusions. And such is the case once more as blood costs are now being associated with the AstraZeneca shot. Fragile hopes were shot down once more in yet another example where two passengers on a cruise ship recently tested positive for the plague, even though both individuals had been inoculated. The CDC has sought to lay heavy requirements on the industry obligating 95% of a ship's crew and passengers be vaccinated, but state governors have intervened so far to prevent measures from extending as far as vaccine passports. These kinds of thoughts are passing the minds of various leaders, though, due to steep declines in voluntary people seeking vaccination which is down as much as 75% in some calculations. The inoculation rates are said to be lowest in the South, despite incentives like money and beer. And some medical professionals surmise that that shallow number of vaccinations could potentially produce another surge. Among those reluctant to accept the jab are also some medical professionals, but hospitals are reported to be cracking down, mandating workers be inoculated or risk termination. Worldwide, underlying illnesses have reportedly terminated the lives of more people afflicted with COVID so far in 2021 than in all of 2020. The records reflect 1.8 million deaths so far for 2021, while there was 1.88 million deaths recorded for 2020. Globally, the number reported to have succumbed to COVID-related illnesses and co-infections since the plague officially emerged is 3 million, but that number is now widely regarded as a severe underestimate. Restrictions might renew in their severity of cases of the plague surge in the Philippines once more. This is according to the country's president, Rodrigo Duarte, who is faced with having to make choices as the country floods with multiple variants. Beijing also has its eye on a variant of concern surfacing in Guangzhou. The Chinese government has referred to the mutant as alarming for the fact that it can be asymptomatic, transferred by means other than the modes of recognized transmission, and has also been found amongst those who were vaccinated. Authorities are pointing out, however, that none of the cases attributed to the new variant have been deadly. Nevertheless, the government, which views the variant as the worst mutant that it has faced so far has, has imposed a strict lockdown in the area, only allowing movement for those going back and forth for testing. Tests in India have revealed the presence of two new mutations in that country, which medical officials are calling super infective. The first one, which has been named N44OK, is said to be 10 times more infective than previous strains, capable of entering its host and replicating much faster. The second variant has been dubbed B11282, which has produced symptoms such as weight loss and various forms of lung damage. Doctors are hoping to provoke the body to produce antibodies for these variants as well. For IPN News, I'm Larry McGee, Katan Jeff, back to you. Well, it doesn't seem like India is getting any relief. Now they have this more severe variant. They were already hit hard, mm -hmm. and now it looks like their situation just got a little worse. Yeah, sad. Well, many countries are trying to deal with COVID-19 as best as they know how. In Southeast Asia, 
Uh, they have been seeing an increasing number of cases in the last few months. Now take a look at this video to see the steps that Malaysia is applying to deal with tackling new infections. Yeah, well, Malaysia, like other countries, have seen in the last several months that those measures on lockdown is what's kind of really, even though it kind of hurts economically, it's kind of slowing the, the rapid spread of the virus down. So. Well, an international organization pushing for disarmament of nuclear weapons has revealed that the U.S. has accounted for 50 percent of global spending on nuclear weapons in 2020, and that spending is a total of $37.4 billion. Well, that number is higher than a combined spending of not one or two uh, of the next big nuke spenders, but eight countries combined. It accounts for 5% of the total military budget, and, uh, and that is of the United States. And on average, um, the U.S. spends over $70,000 per minute on nuclear wow. weapons. Well, you'd think that COVID-19 would curb spending on nuclear weapons as resources were diverted to flattening the curve of the coronavirus. But of the biggest nuclear weapon spenders across the globe, spending went up on average of $1.4 billion more compared to the year 2019 spending. Still thinking about war, 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 even though yep. everybody's battling COVID. Well, even though former U.S. President Trump and the current President Biden seem to be at odds over a lot of things, one thing that has held its course is the U.S.'s stance on China. The Biden administration uh, seems focused to show uh, that they're just as tough on China as the Trump administration was. Well, U.S. President Biden has made sure that China knows that the U.S. is on its coattail by sending naval vessels to the South China Sea breaking long-standing agreements and even sending diplomats to Taiwan. Now, one reason for all these political and military moves is that China is on track to surpass the U.S. in economic strength in the near future. Now, in order for the U.S. to remain number one globally, one of their moves is to persuade allies not to get too close to China. Jake Sullivan, the U U.S. National Security Advisor at a recent G7 Leaders Conference outlined one of the president's tasks to members uh, for financing uh, digital, physical, and health infrastructures uh, for the developing world. He also talked about a high standard, climate-friendly, transparent, and rules-based alternative to what China is offering. Well, this, in addition to the new supply chain strike force that's in the works, that's meant to find violations that cut the United States out of its supply chains that could be addressed with trade solutions. Although China has not been openly named as the target, as the reason for the task force, uh, back in February, President Biden ordered a look into four sectors, pharmaceuticals, critical minerals, large capacity batteries, and semiconductor chips. Well, uh, China plays a large role in all the factors except semiconductors, which Taiwan is the main player. Now, pharmaceuticals is a critical factor, especially after the U.S. faced challenges getting supplies after COVID-19. And remember when COVID-19 first started, everybody was running short on their medical supplies. That's right, that's right. 
Uh, and to address that issue, the White House announced a plan to manufacture more critical medicines in the United States through expanded use of the Defense Production Act. Now, the legislation gets its roots from the Cold War, where the president uh, has authority to direct industrial production for national defense purposes. Well, the U.S.'s defense budget makes up 40 percent of the defense budget of the entire world. Now, taking the seven next largest spenders of military spending and add up their budgets would bring you to understand what the U.S. spends in just one year. Now, even with that, the U.S. is looking to increase its military budget by $5 billion, and China, they say, is the reason. Well, top brass of the United States military is proposing moving military troops into the islands of the South China Sea to be in close quarters with China. Well, the U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said in a press briefing that one of the main challenges to our free and open regional order is China. Mr. Austin issued an internal directive at the Pentagon calling for several initiatives to counter China. Now, in a statement on the directive, he said, the initiatives I am, I am putting forward today are nested inside the larger U.S. government approach to China and will help inform the development of the national defense strategy we are working on. Well, that directive is based on the recommendation of a high-level Pentagon task force. China responded to the directive by saying that it is just another excuse for the U.S. to spend more on the tools of war. Well, China's Foreign Affairs Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin uh, said that playing the China card has become an excuse for the U.S. to increase its military expenditure and build up military strength. Well, the Biden administration called for more than $5 billion to be spent on the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, which plans to modernize U.S. military assets in China's region by funding radar, satellites, and missile systems. Now, China insists that it isn't the problem, but rather that the issue is the attitude of the United States. Hmm. Well, lastly, uh, Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, is struggling to stay in office uh, and is said to have tried to upset an alliance of right-wing and left-wing centralists and Arab lawmakers that claim to have just enough votes to take him out of that office. Well, Netanyahu is accusing this newest coalition who is trying to unseat him of the greatest election fraud in the history of democracy, a coalition led by former ally Naftali Bennett. Well, he heads an uneasy alliance that includes an Arab Islamist party for the first time. Well, the, this crisis comes just weeks after fighting Hamas militants and in the middle of a corruption case against Benjamin Netanyahu and the charges he denies. Now, he has also been accused of stoking unrest, and the Israeli security chief has warned of the violence in the days ahead. Now, Bennett, who is on track to be the next prime minister, has told Benjamin Netanyahu to just let it go and not to leave a scorched earth behind him. Well, that seems to be exactly where mankind is headed in regards to Bennett's comment on a scorched earth as we move closer and closer. You know, we are dealing with the pandemic, which we have been for over a year now. But at the same time, surprisingly, uh, not only the United States, but the next, you know, seven or eight larger um, big nuclear powers had an average of $1.4 billion increase in their military budget spending. So even you, you would think something like this would bring the globe together as we work to combat a, a common threat or a common enemy. Now the, 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 the concern still seems to be on making war with others. And you know, along with the U.S.'s increased spending, saying that, hey, we need this much $1.4 billion more, you know, they have to have a reason, and that reason, of course, they're saying is China. We want to, you know, keep up with China or be prepared for China, which, you know, that has been uh, something we've been talking about quite often here in the news, the U.S. and China tensions, uh, because China is on track to overtake 
the United States economically, and the U.S. just isn't going to have it. Well, one of the things that is of note in regards to China and their economics is they don't have the debt that the United right. States has. We have trillions of dollars in debt and a, and a huge deficit currently in China, and a lot of other countries don't have that debt, so that gives them a lot more buying power, buying power that many countries are very interested in investing in as well. Right. That's a great point. Well, if you'd like to learn more about uh, the current prophecies that we're living in, as well as the uh, definite upcoming nuclear war that is looming on the horizon as the nations continue to be enraged with their own activities, contact the House of Yahweh. And when you do, don't forget to request your free copy of the Prophetic Word magazine and the monthly newsletter. Here's how. To contact the House of Yahweh, you can write them at the House of Yahweh, P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas 79604. You can call them at 1-800-613-9494. Visit them on any of their websites by going to Yahweh.com or YeshuaHawkins.com. You can also go to Yahweh'sBranch.com. If you would like, please visit our website by going to YPNNews.com. If you'd like to email the House of Yahweh, you can do so by emailing info at Yahweh.com. For any international calls, you can call the number that's up on your screen right now. And once again, if you take a look, um, if you take a look at your screen, you'll see the websites for two amazing programs, the Israel Says program by going to IsraelSays.com and the Ask Israel program, you can go to AskIsrael.com. Well, don't go anywhere because up next is Israel Hawkins with more great information to direct your mind and your actions towards ways that bring forth life and peace. For all of us here at YPN News, I'm Katana Alexander. And I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. Thank you for watching.